Thank you, Professor Ren, for the really nice introduction. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here and uh, to share off our research with you. So today I want to talk about agile and robust microarray robot powered by soft artificial muscles. In our title, there are two keywords. The two keywords are micro and soft. In the first part of my talk, I will be focusing on explaining what are micro robot, what are unique functions of micro robot. And then in the second part of my talk, I will explain to you about a new direction we are exploring that is trying to create soft actuators that can power agile micro robot. So let's start with the question of what are micro robots? When we think about robots, we usually think about large scale robots such as trains or airplanes that span the scale of meters to the scale of hundreds of meters. On the other end of the spectrum, we can think about very tiny robot made of the MEMS technology. They usually range from tens of microns to hundreds of microns. What I want to focus on today is talking about insect scale robot. And specifically, they range from one to five centimeter and their weight range from 10 milligrams to 10 grams. While I was a graduate student at Harvard, I worked on a project that's called the RoboV. So the RoboV weighs 80 milligram and it flaps its wings from 120 to 260 hertz, very similar to a bee in nature. If you look at the timeline of this project, you can see a very interesting trend. In the first part of this project, we focus on realizing functions that large traditional robot can do, such as takeoff or hovering flight. In later part of this project, we start to think about interesting functions such as teaching the robot to swim in water, such as teaching the robot to perch on compliant leaf, or even more impressively, teach the robot to uh, impossibly transition from water back into air through combustion. So the theme of my talk today will be explaining to you how we first implementing function that large traditional robot can do, and then use interesting physics to enable function that are challenging, if not impossible for larger scale robots. So now let's address some several important questions together. The first one is why do we study microrobotics? Well, to me, there are two reasons. The first one is we can leverage interesting physics at the centimeter scale to enable novel functions. In this case, we are trying to show a robot can both fly and swim by using, by, using, um, by adjusting the flapping frequency. Now, in addition to enabling new functions, we can also investigate small scale physics by using those micro robots as interesting platforms. By explaining or uh, investigating the flow field that's generated by a flapping wing robot, we can infer about the lift and drag generation mechanism of a flying insect. The second question I want to address is what makes micro robot unique? And the short answer is that the inertia of micro robots are very small and therefore new properties arise. For example, micro robots are robust. You can drop them from a meter above and they see very small change to its performance. And more than that, my colleague showed that the robot can leverage surface effect. You know, in this video, you can see that a very tiny micro robot can jump off the surface of water, something that's very challenging, if not impossible for larger traditional robots. The next question you may ask is, well, what are potential applications of micro robot? One thing that we can think about in the short term is trying to use micro robot to do inspection. So again, we can put a small camera on a crawling robot. I have this robot to climb inside of a turbine engine and try to look for cracks on the turbine plate. And in addition, in the long term, we can think about using a swarm of autonomous micro robot to do search and rescue missions in highly complex environment. Now, I want to say that this vision is a little bit far-fetched. We are still at least 15 to 20 years away from this uh, application, but toward the end of this talk, we are gonna come back to talk about the major challenges and how to approach those goals in the next 10, 20 or 30 years. So today I want to focus on three projects. In the first project, I want to explain to you a project in which we built a hybrid aeroaquatic micro robot, that is a robot that can fly and swim, the second project will focus on explaining a hybrid terrestrial aquatic micro robot, a robot that can walk on land, on the surface of water, and also underwater. The theme of the first two projects is to convince you that although micro robots are small, they can achieve very interesting functions in very complex environments. The third part of my talk will be focusing on a new class of micro robot that is powered by soft artificial muscles. 
And in contrast to con uh, conventional thinking, we want to show that soft robot can be agile and robust, and they can operate at, at, at really high frequencies. So with that, let's talk about the first project. First, I want to introduce flapping wing robot. We look into nature for inspiration. A flapping wing robot has two degrees of freedom, the wing stroke motion and the wing pitch motion. I just want to emphasize here that the stroke motion is actively controlled by the piezoelectric actuator, whereas the wing pitch rotation is passively mediated by air and the wing inertia. So this passive fluid structure interaction is very important. It's a recurring theme that will happen over and over again in our research. We have first came up with experimental tools that allow us to measure the flow field that's generated by the flapping wing motion so that we can understand flapping wing physics. And on top of that, we can also develop numerical simulations that allow us to understand the underlying physics and the underlying fluid flow. With those experimental and computational tools, we are ready to think about interesting questions. For example, we want to ask the question about, is there similarities between flapping in water versus flapping in air? And if there is a similarity, then can we enable new functions in our robot? In this case, can we allow a flying robot to also swim in water? So we came up with a project proposal in that we want the same robot to be able to both fly in the air, swim in water, and making transitions from air to water and from water back into air. Okay, so first, Let's think about the challenges. There are two major challenges. The first one is how do we allow this same robot to use the same set of actuator and wings to fly in air and swim in water? And the second challenge is how do we overcome surface tension effect at this very small scale? So first, let's talk about multimodal local motion. To solve the challenge, we first look into nature for inspiration. Puffins are very amazing animals. They can fly in the sky. They can take a dive into water. Once they're under the water, they change their flapping frequency so they can swim around and chase for prey. Inspired by their local motion, we start to write out very simple equations. We impose the robot has to support its own weight in both air and water. Then we can relate the flapping frequency in air and in water. And then we can look at the scaling of Reynolds number. And to our surprise, the Reynolds number scaling are actually very similar which really means that the two systems, if you adjust the flapping frequency accordingly, will be able to have similar fluid structure interaction. We used our numerical simulation that predicts we can in fact get very, very close lift and drag forces in air and in water. Motivated by this computational result, we conducted flapping experiments in air and in water. So this is a very exciting video for us because it shows by slowing down the flapping frequency of the wing, we can induce very, very similar flapping kinematics. And let me remind you again that the wing flapping motion is passive. So the fact that we are able to generate similar kinematics really implies we are able to generate similar forces. So this experiment shows the robot is able to lift itself in water and swim. The next challenge is to think about stability. So we write out full 10 degrees of freedom equation of motion. For the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the mathematical modeling, but just say that the model predicts we can achieve passive upright stability in water. So in this case, we showed a robot was able to swim at 11 hertz and can reach the air-water interface. And in both experiments and simulation, we are able to observe the similar effect. And the key in this passive stability is that the damping on the robot body is able to stabilize the robot. So the short message is that the robot is passively unstable in air, but it can be uh, passively stable in water. With that, we try to put everything together. So that's what, that's what about uh, five years ago, we showed that a robot was able to take off and at that time has to plunge into water because transitioning from air to water was extremely difficult. Once the robot transitions into water, we are able to turn on the robot at a much lower flapping frequency, about 10 hertz, and the robot can swim back to the air water interface. Now, that was a very exciting moment for us because for the first time, we are able to show a robot can uh, do complicated things in a complex environment while this robot is only 0.1 gram. 
So now let's talk about the second part of the challenge with enabling the robot to transition from water back into air. Specifically, we have to think about surface tension effects. And let's now identify the challenges imposed by surface tension. The major challenge that we see is that the surface tension is 12 times the robot weight, which really means it's also four times the maximum robot lift. So just by flapping its wings, it's impossible for the robot to break the water surface tension and transition back into air. So how do we overcome this effect? Well, we can overcome this effect by thinking very carefully that surface tension effect is very strong, but it's only singular at the water surface. So if we can create an impulsive mechanism that can generate a large force for a short period of time, we are able to break the water surface. So here we presented a two-step process. In the first step, we are going to use electrolysis to split water into gases. And we are going to use the buoyancy to push part of the robot out of the water. In the second part, we are going to ignite the mixture of oxygen and hydrogen so we can impulsively push the robot out of the water surface. So with that, we transition to a new robot design. The new robot has new wings, new buoyant out triggers, and a central combustion chamber. So first of all, let me just mention that the, bu the buoyant out triggers helps the robot to maintain stability on the water surface. What's more interesting about this new robot is the central gas collection chamber. The chamber is consisted of a titanium top piece four carbon fiber side pieces, and a multifunctional component in the center. This component consists of a pair of parallel plates that we can use to split water into gases, and a sparker plate that we can use to ignite the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. So now let me show you how this works. At a low voltage of five volt, we can start splitting water into gases, and those gases will be captured by a gas collection chamber once the chamber is full, we can ignite everything. So in this case, we can send in a 200 volt signal and we can use the sparker to ignite the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. So now let me put everything together. First, we show the robot can swim in water. It can swim to the air water interface. Once it reaches the air water interface, we are going to uh, start collecting gas uh, and use a buoyancy force to push the robot wings out of the water surface. Once the robot wings are out of the, uh, the water surface, we are ready for impulsive takeoff. So I would recommend you to pay close attention to the next video because it's going to be uh, relatively quick. Okay, so now we are going to ignite. And using a high-speed camera, we can see that this impulsive combustion will complete within one one thousandth of a second. And we spend a lot of time trying to make sure the robot is uh, uh, not going to be uh, damaged by the combustion process. Now, the next video is also going to be fast. It's going to show you a takeoff and landing process. Again, please pay close attention to the early part of the next video. So in this case, we are going to uh, ignite, and you will see the robot sort of uh, jumps off and land in 0.5 seconds. And now I'll show you the same experiment again using a high-speed camera. Again. After the robot takes off, it cannot fly because of all the water that's on the robot. What it has to do, it has to passively land on ground, wait for a little while, maybe five to 10 minutes. And after the robot is dried, you can fly the robot again. So to summarize, we have created a multifunctional micro robot that is able to fly, it is able to swim, it can transition from air to water, and more impressively, it can use a combustion to transition from water back into air and can also pass it land on ground. And this process is repeatable. Okay, so again, the theme of the research is micro robot can do complicated things in complicated environment. Now let's change gear to talk about the second project in which I'll introduce a hybrid terrestrial aquatic micro robot. In the first project, you know, we spend a lot of effort to overcome a surface tension effect that's 10 times the robot weight. If we think about ourselves as humans, we barely feel surface tension at all because our weight is more than a thousand times of surface tension effect. Now, if we create something in between, if we create a robot that weighs about one gram, and has a contact lens on the order of 10 centimeter, then the surface tension force and the robot weight are on the same order, and we can think about interesting applications. So again, we start by asking an interesting physics question, which is how do we control the magnitude of surface tension? 
And if we can control surface tension, then what new robot locomotive capabilities can be achieved? So we come up with a new project in the sense that we want the robot to be able to crawl on land, on the surface of water, controllably transition into water, and eventually return back onto land. So again, let's think about the major challenges. The first challenge is how do we allow the same robot to be able to float on the water and also controllably transition into water when it wants to? And the second challenge is, again, how do we do multi-phase locomotion, both moving on ground and also moving on the water surface? To solve those challenges, we came up with a robot design. Specifically, we put electro bedding foot pad on the robot. And the idea is that we are going to use a combination of surface tension force and the surface tension induced buoyancy force to float the robot on the water surface. Now, it's really not very challenging to float a robot on the water surface. What is challenging is achieving controllable transition without using any moving parts. So we used a physical phenomenon called electrovetting. And the idea is that we are going to insulate a conductive electrovetting foot pad with a dielectric material. We are going to send a high voltage to the electrovetting foot pad that will modulate the contact angle theta. Once the contact angle changes, you're going to see a reduction of buoyancy force, and that will allow the robot to controllably sink into water. We show that we can reduce the surface tension force by about 50%, and that allows us to controllably uh, enable the robot to transition into water without using any moving parts. So in, in, in some sense, we have solved the first problem without needing new action. Now let's talk about the second challenge, which is how to move effectively on the water surface. I want to again start by saying that using a local motion gate for working on land is very ineffective for moving on the water surface. The robot is barely moving at all. Instead, again, we look into nature for inspiration. Uh, diving beetles sort of are really amazing insect that in the sense that they use asymmetric propulsion motions to swim effectively in water. In the power stroke, they fully extend their leg to maximize thrust, whereas in the retraction stroke, they retract their legs to minimize drag. Using a similar idea, we have created a passive foot pad that exploits passive fluid structure interaction. In the power stroke, the um, flaps will remain fully engaged, whereas in the slow recovery stroke, the flaps will collapse. And again, in simulation, we show that we can get asymmetric flapping motion, and that implies we can get uh, propulsive forces. We are able to show we can swim at a speed of 2.5 centimeter if we actuate the robot at about five hertz. So with that, let me try to put everything together. We showed a robot that is able to move on land, transition on the water surface. It will swim to a targeted site. Once it reaches a targeted site on the water surface, it will sink into water. So now I would recommend you to focus on the side view of this video. Okay, so once the robot swims to the side, it will now sink into water completely. And then it will try to climb this incline to return back onto land. Something I don't have time to talk to you about is it's actually very challenging to climb this incline and return back on land because the surface tension is now pushing down the robot. It'll do a lot, a lot of redesign so the robot can overcome the surface tension effect. But eventually, right, we show that the robot can start on land and end on land. So this is, again, a repeatable process. Until very recently, we are thinking about extending the functionality of the robot. In addition to do swimming and uh, transitioning, we also want the robot to be able to climb uh, on vertical and inverted surfaces. So again, we think about capillary effects. And for the interest of time, let me not go into the physics, but let me just say that by looking at capillary adhesion theory and lubrication uh, models, we can obtain that the normal adhesive force and the uh, friction force can be uncoupled. And in fact, we can get very large normal adhesive force and small friction forces so the robot can slide along a surface while remaining attached. With that, we are able to show the robot can climb on an inverted surface at a speed of 0.3 centimeter per second, which is already four times faster than the state-of-the-art approach using electrostatics. Again, the theme is that by leveraging interesting physics, 
surface effect at a centimeter scale, we can build multifunctional and agile microrobotic systems. So that's the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I'll change gears to talk about a new direction in which we will try to combine the field of microrobotics and soft robotics in creating highly agile soft robots. Let me zoom out a little bit first and say that our long-term vision is to create a swarm of ubiquitous multifunctional microrobots. So far, the microrobots I've shown you today are very precise and highly functional. My colleagues are still solving key problems in that they're putting sensors and batteries on board and they're thinking about new control schemes. However, I want to argue that current microrobots have uh, very severe shortcomings, specifically because they're powered by rigid actuators and those rigid piezoelectric actuators are oftentimes fragile. It's very difficult for them to effectively interact with their environment, such as running into an obstacle doing pollination demonstrations. And in addition, it really takes many years to train a graduate student to be able to assemble a microrobot because of the high precision required. How do we solve those key problems? Uh, recently, we started to look into a, another uh, new field, which is soft robotics. We know that we can make a lot of soft robots relatively cheaply, and that soft robots are very robust. They also have very large motion. In terms of sensing and control, most soft robots are still control open loop, but recently we start to see more and more closed loop controlled soft robots. In addition to using a battery, soft robot can also use pneumatic sources or chemical sources. Now, there are also severe issues with soft robots, meaning that most soft robots operate at a low frequency, many uh, lower than 10 hertz. And in addition, their motion precisions are low. So the controllability of soft robots are inferior compared to rigid robots. Our goal is really to merge those two fields and create the best of micro robot and soft robot. So in the remaining 15 minutes or so, I want to explain to you about the new direction we are pushing, which is creating hybrid soft region micro robot. Specifically, I want to introduce a micro robot that's powered by soft, uh, soft power dense actuators, but it still have rigid appendages so that it can effectively interact with their environment. Okay, so I want to convince you that soft actuators can operate at a high frequency, in addition to being robust and having a large strain. In addition, we envision that soft or hybrid soft rigid robot will have highly precise components such as transmissions and uh, wing hinges so that we can have very precise control of the motion. And finally, in addition to achieving flight, we can also demonstrate new functions such as sensing or collision sensing. Okay, I'm going to convince you of all of those points today. In terms of robot design, this robot is uh, sort of similar to the rigid power flapping wing robot in the sense that it has a transmission and has a wing hinge and wing. What we take out from the rigid robot is that now we put in a soft linear actuator. Now compared to the piezoelectric actuator, the piezoelectric actuator can operate at a very high bandwidth, whereas the soft actuator uh, have a slightly lower bandwidth, but still 500 Hertz is sufficient for our applications. Now it has a very large strain on the order of 12%. And because it has a large strain and it is soft, it's tolerant to assembly air. So um, really, you know, we used to make a flying robot in a day or two. Now we can probably make them in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Okay, so with that, if we have a soft actuator, we want to understand what are specific performance metrics we have to achieve such that a soft actuator can enable flight. So the next slide talks about a few design requirements. Don't worry about the formulas yet, but let's just talk about the main takeaway, right? We need to impose the lift force has to be larger than the robot weight, and that requires uh, some performance metric on the operating frequency and uh, free motion. And in addition, we also need to require the robot uh, the actuator force overcome the drag forces. So that requires the actuator to output a certain amount of block force. And finally, we want to enable the matching of inertia so we can obtain a, a resonant frequency of several hundred Hertz. And that really imposes conditions on the wing designs. For the interest of today, let's focus on actuator properties, which are bandwidth, free motion, and block force. Let's first talk about bandwidth. We model our actuator as a series RC circuit, and we can measure the equivalent resistance and capacitance. And we see that for our application, 
we are able to obtain a RC time constant of 0 0.2 milliseconds. And the robot's mechanical property leads to a resonant frequency of 500 Hertz. So the electrical property is really not hindering the mechanical uh, performance. So that's why the actuator can operate at a very high frequency. On top of that, we can also characterize the block force. In this case, we place a actuator under a force sensor, and we show that we can measure the zero to peak motion to quantify the block force at a particular driving condition, meaning at a particular driving frequency and amplitude. For each driving condition, right, we can map this amplitude into a point, and we can map out the robot performance as a function of frequency and driving voltages. Similarly, you can characterize the robot's free, uh, the actuator's free motion. Using a laser vibrometer, you can again measure the peak-to-peak -peak motion. And for each operating condition, you can map it onto a point so that you can obtain the performance chart, which is the robot's peak-to-peak -peak motion as a function of driving frequencies and um, uh, voltage amplitude. And with that, we can put everything together. We can infer about the actuator energy density and power density. And from the previous analysis, we see that if we can achieve a power density that's higher than 200 watt per kilogram, that implies the robot of the actuator will be sufficient to support flight. In this case, our actuator power density is around 550 watt per kilogram, which means that it is sufficient to support flight. Putting everything together, we show that for the first time, a soft actuated robot can flap at 280 Hertz in this case. And by looking at the kinematics, we infer the robot can generate a lift to weight ratio of 1.2 to one. So it will enable takeoff. And so we conducted takeoff experiments. So this again was a very exciting uh, result for us because for the first time we showed a soft actuated robot was able to take off. Well, on the other hand, for those of you who are not working in this field, this may not look very exciting, right? This robot reaches a height of 1.5 centimeter. It flips over within 0.1 seconds. So it's really not very useful. So the next challenge is thinking about how to stabilize the robot. And for those of you who cannot see the video clearly, I'm showing you a composite image showing you the same experiment. In this case, the robot takes off, but very quickly it flips over. To stabilize the robot, we put two units together and we used a phenomenon called precession. Specifically, the robot will rotate around its yaw axis really quickly and it will use the precession effect to stabilize itself. This is similar to a spinning top. Okay, again, I'm going to skip over the mathematical analysis. Uh, to guarantee stability, you have to look at the relative contribution of the moment of inertia tensor and the torque input. But let me just say that in both experiments and in simulation, we show the robot is able to achieve um, stable ascending flight without feedback control. Okay, so in this case, just open loop takeoff flight. And in this case, the robot can ascend at a speed of 30 centimeter per second, already comparable to the state of our robot powered by rigid actuators. So again, for those of you who can't see the video clearly, we can do an open loop takeoff and we can show that in both experiments and in simulation. Now, in the previous uh, uh, videos, I show you that with one unit, we can achieve intrinsically unstable takeoff. With two units, we can achieve passively stable takeoff. The ultimate question for soft robotics is, are soft robots controllable? Especially, are they controllable at a high frequency? And again, skipping over the controller design, let me just say that as of about one or two years ago, we showed the robot was able to achieve controlled hovering flight. And that was a very exciting moment for us. You know, for the first time we showed the robot, a soft actually the robot can fly and it can controllably fly, okay? And in this particular demonstration, we fly the robot for about 15 seconds around the set point. The robot takes off and hover around the set point and you can see that the air in the Z direction and the air in the X, Y planes are you know, on the order of a few centimeters. Now we demonstrate that the soft actually the robot can do what rigid robot can do. Let's think about interesting functions that rigid robot cannot do. For example, soft actuators are robust. You can repeatedly run a wing into an obstacle and the robot will see no damage. And in fact, you can use the soft actuator as a sensor to sense the collision, 
right? In this case, we are trying to monitor the capacitor change in the uh, actuator. And this is very repeatable, uh, even in free flight. When we fly the robot into obstacle, you can sort of identify this collision very reliably by looking at the instantaneous current. The next thing we want to do is that because the robot is robust, now we can operate more than one robot. Right? In this case, we are trying to operate two and show that two robots can take off simultaneously. And in fact, we intentionally run them into a wall just to demonstrate they are very robust against collisions. That is something we would avoid if we would use a rigid powered robot. Until very recently, we started to think about even more interesting functions and we take inspirations from a very famous robot at MIT, the MIT Cheetah. Right, if you think about this bio-inspired MIT uh, Cheetah Mini, right, um, what we can see is that if you kick on it, it can recover from a collision. And in addition, they can do a somersault, that is to flip 360 degree in air. Can we enable similar things in our robot? So the first thing I want to demonstrate is collision recovery. In the first uh, example, I want to show you that we can gently push on the robot and the robot will uh, sort of uh, slowly recover to the hovering set point. Okay, that is something that a lot of the rigid robot can do as well. But in the second uh, experiment, we are going to hit the robot actuator and the robot wings, and this would be very difficult for the rigid powered robot. Imagine hitting the propellers of a quad rotor, right? But in this case, because it's a flapping wing microscale robot, it's actually very robust to collisions of the wings. And the third example, we are going to hit the robot really hard. So the robot will not be able to recover. But as you can see, the robot sort of will hit down the ground and eventually will bounce off the floor and return back into the hovering condition. Okay, so again, for those of you who can't see those videos clearly, I'm going to show you composite image that show you the same thing. So in the first example, we hit the robot and the robot will slowly recover. In the second example, you're going to, or we are going to hit the robot wings and the robot will quickly recover attitude. In the third example, we are going to hit the robot really hard. The robot will bounce on the floor and eventually will return back to the hovering condition. And in this case, you can see the attitude disturbance is larger than 50 degrees. This is very impressive in the sense that it can recover from such a large noise. The second part I want to demonstrate is aggressive maneuvers such as the somersault. In simulation, you now we show our robot can do it the robot will take off from ground, hover in the set point for two seconds, accelerate upward, try to do a flip within 0.16 seconds, and then we'll try to recover to the same hovering condition. And again, let me mention that because it's small, in absolute time, this flipping rate is very, very fast among the fastest robot. Okay, so we can do it in simulation. Let's try to do it in real time. So again, I'll try to play a video in real time first, you will see that the robot will first take off and it will accelerate upwards, try to do the flip, bounce on the floor, and return to the hovering set point. Let me replay the same experiment. Again, the robot takes off and it will hover at the set point and then it will accelerate upwards. Okay. Once it reaches the uh, set point, it will conduct a flip. Now, because our uh, flight arena is very small, the robot cannot recover. It has to sort of bounce on the floor, but once it bounces on the floor, it will bounce back and then it will recover to the hovering condition. Okay, so for those of you who can't see this video uh, clearly, let me show you a composite image showing the same thing. So, first, the robot takes off and hovers around the set point. It will then accelerate upwards and then it will do a somersault within 0 0.16 seconds will try to recover attitude, and finally, will return to the hovering set point. No, uh, you can look at the track robot kinematics, and I just want to mention that this process is very repeatable, so we can do it multiple times. Here, I'm showing the average of five repeating trials. This robot is robust against collisions, and it's very robust to demonstrate those aggressive maneuvers. In summary, we have created a soft aerial robot that is robust and agile. By robust, we mean that the robot is not only resilient against collision, but they can also recover from in-flight collisions. And by agile, we mean that it can demonstrate aggressive maneuvers, such as a butter flip or a somersault within 0.16 seconds. The flight speed or the ascending speed can be as large as 70 centimeters per second, which really places among the fastest soft robots. 
Now, another thing we want to be conscious about is there's still a performance gap between our soft actuated flying robot and the state of our rigid powered flying robot. Back in 2019, right, this uh, robot B was able to achieve solar powered flight, which really marks the state of our performance. And there are key metrics that we can look at, which is the power density of the actuator, the lift to weight ratio of the robot, the actuation voltage and the efficiency of the actuator. If we compare it with what we are first able to get, you're going to see the soft robots really a lot worse. The power density is about 50% of the state of the art. Lift to weight ratio is only 1.2 to one, so we can barely fly. The actuation voltage is seven times higher and the efficiency is 15 times lower. But I also want to mention that we are improving really quickly. You know, three months ago, we published a recent work in TRO. We are able to improve the power density tremendously. The lift to weight ratio is improved to about 2.2 to one. The actual voltage is worse. We now need two kilovolts, but the efficiency is a lot higher. It's about 30 to 40%. And until recently, we are continuing to push on this. Hopefully in the next year or so, we are going to um, be able to share our most recent work. But I just want to mention that we are able to achieve a very high four to one lift to weight ratio. As of a few weeks ago, my student was able to achieve an actuation voltage that's about uh, uh, 950 volts. We are still um, we, we are still far from our goal, but again, hopefully we can share more in the coming months. And now we can still keep a relatively high efficiency number. In addition to thinking about power autonomy, we can also explore in other directions. Well, the other threats we are, we are pushing for is to work on multi-winged robot. Can we create a dragonfly-like robot and study four-wing backwing interaction so that we can improve aerodynamic efficiency? In collaboration with Professor Rob Shepard from Cornell, we are thinking about um, compressed air actuated soft robot. In this case, this robot can operate at 160 hertz. Again, counterintuitive in the sense that soft robots can now operate at very high bandwidth. We want to push for the flight of a large number of robots so that they can operate in clutter environment. And we also want to return to the theme of multimodal locomotion so that we can demonstrate uh, perching or pollination demonstrations. Finally, let me zoom out and say that if we look at the longer term picture, there are really a lot of challenges we need to overcome, right? Power autonomy, thinking about sensor and control algorithms, thinking about swarm algorithms. Um, we are very far from this uh, vision, but also we are making a lot of progress. We are improving the robot capabilities really quickly, and we are also improving uh, efficiency and control. I would argue that the next 10 or 20 years will be a very exciting time for people who work on microbiotic research, especially there will be a lot of new applications that will be enabled by this class of research. Finally, I just want to thank my previous advisors, Professor Rob Wood, Professor David Clark, and Professor Jane Wong. Over the years, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of uh, amazing collaborators. And also, I just want to say, currently, uh, a lot of the project that we are working on are led by my students. So I'm truly grateful of everyone who sort of have uh, advised me, worked with me, and uh, sort of helping me along in the past five, six years. With that, let me end here, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank Prof, uh, Prof Chen, a uh, very fantastic work. Um, uh, we have uh, two ways to raise questions from the audience. One is you can chat, uh, utilize the chat box to type your questions over there. I see we already have a few questions. And the other way is you can raise your hand and then our volunteer is gonna allow you to speak out. So maybe we can uh, start from the questions at the chat box. Um, so maybe I can also read out the questions so that the other audience can also uh, about that. So the first question is nice talk. And can you talk about software control of your micro robot actuation? Is there any benefit to add active control, uh, for example, variable impedance control to the multimodal locomotions? Um, sure. So this is a very good question. I think uh, um, 
Nonlinear control is, is, is certainly something that we are looking to incorporate in our robot. Currently, we are just using very simple PD controllers to demonstrate those hovering flight. And we are collaborating with other groups now to think about a more complicated controller to demonstrate more aggressive maneuvers. But there's one thing I want to say, which is that the dynamics of micro scale robots are really fast. So in addition to pushing for more complicated controller or nonlinear controller, we are more interested in efficient uh, controllers, meaning that because we need to have a feedback rate of 10 kilohertz, we really want everything to be computationally efficient so that we can place them on board in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from Michael Young. Um, the question is, the soft robot project is really interesting. Um, is it possible to add a can of mini camera visual sensors so that the robot can do perception and understanding of the environment? I think it's more regarding uh, the, the, the vision feedback or some of the application perspective. Sure. So putting on, mm -hmm. putting on board sensors on those micro scale platforms are also something we are exploring. In fact, my colleagues are leading those works. Um, so let me say that those, the robot we are trying to build are small. Their payload is, are, is also small, but uh, it's more than sufficient to carry onboard cameras. In fact, well, my previous colleague has demonstrated that the robot can carry a 10 milligram camera that has very, actually very high resolution images and we can do sensing and stuff. So the challenge again is not so much carrying cameras. We are physically, we are able to carry those cameras. I think the challenge is to have efficient algorithms so that we can detect the surrounding very quickly. And let me just also say that because dynamics is uh, quick, you're going to have a lot of oscillation. So stabilizing that camera and be able to extract useful information from those cameras is, uh, is very important. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple more questions coming out. Um, so let me quickly read out the questions. So uh, next question is, since the insect-like robot is very lightweight, how do you deal with a situation where the environmental resilient, uh, resistance disturbance is large? For example, is there any strong wind or water flow coming onto the robot? How are you going to handle that? Sure. So again, that's a very good question. Let me say that uh, compared to its uh, size and weight, the robot can actually overcome a large, a relatively large disturbances. What I mean by that is it can fly in a room in which the ambient flow, if we send in an ambient flow that's on the order of 0 0.5 to 1 meter per second, the robot was still able to hover. Okay, so uh, I would say that it's just like insect. If you try to you know, fly the robot outdoor, in which you have you know, really strong wind, that's probably very difficult. But if for most indoor environments, um, the robot can actually uh, perform really fine. Um, but, but yes, I think the capability of fighting against those environmental uh, uh, factors is something that we still have to do research on. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, why don't you use two DEAs to control both things separately rather than using single DEA for both things? And the other one related to other sensors, for example, inertial measurement urine, are you gonna, uh, is that uh, utilized or not? Or if not, are you gonna think about the inertial measurement unit? Sure, yeah. so let me answer mm -hmm. the first question. So it's a, it's a very good idea actually to uh, drive sort of two wings separately. And that's in fact, mm -hmm. something that we are currently working on. Uh, two years ago, we started with a single DA because as I've shown that the lift to weight ratio is 1 to 1 1.2 to 1, so we can barely fly. At that time, we want to get as much power density at, uh, out as possible. So even adding a connection would add more weight. Now we are at four to one, so we have a lot more uh, uh, space to play with. So we are definitely, you know, we are currently working on a new design in which we split the room actually into two and then we can drive the wings uh, separately. In respect to the second question about the sensors. So again, I think, uh, you know, I'm personally interested in doing research work in uh, sensing, but uh, I, th I think a lot of my previous colleague, my, like Professor uh, Farrell Helpling is leading research in that direction. I would say again, carrying sensors is not hard. The robot has the payload to carry the sensor. I think the hard part is to do efficient computation and also uh, to think about power sources. You know, one day our dream is to have the robot carry its own computers, right? And batteries and sensors. And how to put all those things together is a, is a huge challenge that our field should address. 
Okay, thanks. Um, so maybe I can also chip in a question uh, before we uh, read up the next question. So I noticed one of the demonstration, uh, you want to stabilize the uh, uh, micro robot and you have to make the precision, uh, precision stuff like a twisting or spinning motion. Uh, is that a uh, compulsory movement or somehow in the future uh, we can we can do just a normal uh, taking off like the current drone uh, taking off? Oh, right, so that was actually, you know, again, our first flight in the in that demonstration, the key point is there, is, there isn't any feedback or sensing or control. We are leveraging mm -hmm. the, the sort of passive stable dynamics so the robot needs to use that spinning effect so that it can uh, fly off. Again, that's when it's very limited in terms of controllability so that we can do it without sensing and feedback. The later demonstrations, right, the hovering demonstration or the somersault mm -hmm. demonstration, we no longer need it. So I think, again, mm -hmm. it's a trade-off. If we don't have uh, sensing capability, then all we can do is really passively, stably uh, uh, fly mm -hmm. upwards. If we have sensing and feedback capabilities, then we can, of course, do more aggressive things. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, so maybe uh, we can take the last question. Uh, uh, using two different actuators and placely offer uh, precision free stability. Would using two different actuators implicitly? Okay. So that's a very good question. So, you know, uh, let's just talk about the Robo B, right? The Robo B uses two actuators and it can achieve hovering flight. Um, however, my feeling is that if we split our actuator into two, we can probably do something similar to the Robo B in that we can hover stably in air, but it's still very difficult to control the yaw rotation. So in some sense, we would be able to stably stay in some place in air, but it wouldn't be very stable in terms of the steering angle. So um, I would, you know, I, I, my feeling is because the soft actuators are easy to make and they're fairly robust, my personal favor is to add more degrees of freedom so we can do more complicated things. So the current design is very simple. What we are trying to do is now to use more actuator, but, but still thinking about a scenario in which we use four actuators to control two wings. So now, we can have a lot more control over the flapping kinematics, so we can do both the both stabilization and uh, very agile control. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are running out of time. Uh, so we have seen a great talk, uh, fantastic work. Congratulations, Kevin, for uh, continuing making a lot of fantastic work. Uh, so uh, we are looking forward to see more uh, astounding work in the future, uh, hopefully very soon. As you mentioned, you're, you're overcoming one difficulty and another difficulty, we see a lot of uh, uh, progress on the way. Uh, yeah, great. it's so, truly an honor to speak today here. So uh, it's really yeah. nice seeing all and, of you. And also just for information, here we have uh, 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 around 60 uh, audience, but at Bilibili, we have a couple, more than a couple of thousands oh, wow. uh, <laughs> audience. <laughs> so you have great outreach uh, uh, in terms of your research and um, publication. So uh, we, hopefully you're going to attract more and more young uh, researchers in the field. Um, so we're going to overcome the challenge together. So with that, uh, to thank Kevin again, uh, and we also thank the audience. I think we're going to officially conclude the session. Thank you, Kevin. Great okay, thank talk. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.